The runners took their places. At the signal, they sprang across the line and down the course, pouring like clouds. Now with the goal in sight, nieces flashed out ahead of them to first place, as swiftly as the wind or wings of thunder. The next, though only after a long gap, was Salius. Euryalus came third, some distance back. Halimus followed him, and after that, Diore sped. His foot brushed on a heel, his shoulder loomed. And had the track been longer, he would have slipped ahead or tied for fourth. But as they came exhausted to the last stretch, poor Nisus skidded in some slippery blood which had poured down and wet the grassy ground when, as it happened, steers were slaughtered there. Already thrilled with victory, the young man did a short dance against the fall, but fell face first in filthy dung and sacred blood. Hello and welcome once again to The Spouter Inn. I'm Chris. And I'm Suzanne. And this time we have read Virgil's Aeneid. And not for the first time. Yeah, I've read bits and pieces of it again and again in English, in different translations, or in Latin over the years. Keep coming back to it. It's a big text. Are you a fan of the Aeneid? Uh, I, I think it's really interesting, and I think it's really important. And every time I read it, I'm really enchanted. Like, I'll notice new connections or new points of comparison or ways it's influenced this or that work. And so I find it really interesting. But I don't, like, have love for it. Like, I don't have any feelings about it. Like, I admire it, but the way you admire something kind of coldly, I don't have any irrational feelings about it. Yeah, every time I read it, I usually find something new to like and appreciate. But overall, it's not a work that has done a lot for me. Although, as you say, yes, it's a very important and very interesting work. Sometimes when I'm reading a book for this podcast and I'm feeling a little unsure about it, I like to ask my friends on Facebook what they think about it, if they love it and why they love it, just so that I can get out of my own headspace a bit. So I asked this to my friends, and many people did say, yeah, so I love it, here's why, blah, blah, blah. You got a ton of responses. Yeah, there, a lot of people were excited to talk about it. But I was both surprised and not that several people just said, oh, it's very important. Mm. Oh, you can't imagine the European literary tradition without it. It's a foundational text. It was the most important text for a thousand years or something like that. Which is, which is arguably true. I'm not disagreeing with any of that, yeah. but that's not, yeah. the, that's not what I asked. What I asked is, do you like it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that became an interesting way of not answering that question. But some people loved it, right? Some people loved it. Some people found parts of it very haunting. Some people found parts of it very beautiful. Some people found parts of it very tragic. Some people have studied it in Latin and have lines from it that echo in their heads. It's, it's clearly a text that means a lot to a lot of people, but uh, it doesn't mean as much to me. But I'm still hoping that we can say interesting things about it, because I'm glad to know it, and I'm glad to have read it. Like I'm glad to have a bit of it under my belt. One of the things that's really neat is when people were responding to your question, reading it in Latin did not necessarily tell you whether they would love or hate it. You know, there are people who love it, and it's clearly the engagement with the Latin language that is a big part of that love. And for others, they're like, oh, God. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm definitely in that category. I read this in my undergrad Latin class. We spent mm -hmm. an entire semester or two on it, on, on book six, on like the most beloved part, the, the trip mm -hmm. to the underworld. Mm -hmm. And wow, did I not enjoy that time. <laughs> now, obviously, you know, there's the questions of who was teaching it and blah, blah, blah. But like having that much interaction with Virgil's language didn't win me over to it. The way that, for example, spending time with Ovid's language won me over to his Latin. Mm, I remember you talking about that. Yeah, if Ovid is the treat you get mm. at the end of learning Latin, Virgil is very <laughs> much the the pasty gray dinner you get. No, Aww. that might be unfair, but that's, harsh. that's certainly how it felt like to me. <laughs> so just in case anyone hasn't read the Aeneid, let me go over the plot real quickly. It's the tale of Aeneas, the son of the god Venus and the human Anchises, who himself is a member of Trojan nobility. And he's escaping Troy after its destruction, and he's been commanded by the gods to found a new city in Italy. But one of those gods, Juno, is angry at him and throws endless obstacles in his way. So our tale begins with a storm that throws him on the shores of Africa, the city of Carthage, which was recently founded and is now being ruled by Queen Dido. Dido welcomes the Trojans and asks them for news. That's basically book one. In book two, Aeneas recounts to Dido the fall of Troy, particularly focusing on the whole incident with the Trojan horse, and how Aeneas managed to escape with his young son and his old father, but his wife doesn't make it out alive, unfortunately. 
but also very necessarily. Then, in book three, Aeneas describes the first few years of his wanderings, including a few failed attempts at founding a city in places other than Italy, the place where he's supposed to found a city. Anyway, along the way, he also revisits a few friends from the Odyssey, including Scylla, <laughs> Charybdis, and the Cyclops Polyphemus. And right before they land in Carthage, Aeneas's father dies. So, okay, we're all cut up, and so book four can be about the doomed love affair between Dido and Aeneas. The gods cause them to fall in love, but the gods also force Aeneas to leave and get back to founding that city in Italy like he's supposed to. And so Dido, furious and desperate, curses Aeneas and his descendants and kills herself upon a pyre. Well, she's totally right. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I'm sure we'll talk about that, but yes. Book five, then, has the Trojans landing in Sicily, which is another place that is in Italy, so don't try to found a city there. But it is now the anniversary of Aeneas' father's death, so Aeneas suggests that they have eight days of mourning rites, followed by a day of ritual sports. So that's fun. Then they head off, and in book six, they finally reach Italy proper. Aeneas has been told that he needs to visit the Sibyl, the prophet of Apollo, to learn more about his future and Rome's future. And while he's there, he asks, hey, isn't this also the entrance to the underworld? Can I just go down for a second and see my dad? (laughs) So they go down, they see dad, they see Anchises, as well as a bunch of other dead friends, including Dido, who does not look at him. Not (laughs) a friend. (laughs) Very cold shoulder to him and good for her. Then Aeneas gets to see a bunch of people who aren't even born yet, the future great people of Rome. No one has ever read the second half of the Aeneid, but I'm told (laughs) that it tells of Aeneas finally arriving in Latium, in that part of Italy he's supposed to get to, and of a squabble between Aeneas and a guy named Turnus over the right to marry the king of Latium's daughter, Lavinia. There's a few more books of battles and such, and finally Aeneas and Turnus battle each other in single combat. Turnus is not the son of a god, and therefore he's totally outmatched by Aeneas. So he's going to lose, he begs for his life, and Aeneas is tempted to grant it, but he's reminded that Turnus has killed his good friend Pallas, and so he shows him no mercy, none at all. And so it ends, incensed, he thrust the sword through Turnus's chest. His enemy's body soon grew cold and helpless, while the indignant soul flew down to Hades. That's the last line, the end. It's a grim end. It's an abrupt and startling end, and I, mm-hmm. I understand that this was meant to be a much longer poem. That this is only the first half of, of an originally 24-book poem that he was planning, but that he didn't get around to. He didn't even finish the first 12 books that we have before he died. Well, that's one of the really enigmatic things about the Aeneid, right? Like, we know that Virgil dies with it being incomplete, and he left word that it was supposed to be burned after his death. Um, the ruler and his patron at the time, Augustus Caesar, did not want that to happen, especially because this is such great Rome propaganda, and put together kind of a committee to polish it up. But, I mean, it, it doesn't seem to be the case that a whole lot was added, a whole lot was changed. So, if it is only the first part of something that was intended to be much longer, it's a pretty polished version of that first part. You know, in other words, I I don't know if we know for sure whether this really was intended to be twice as long or whether that's part of the mythos that's accrued to the work. Right, exactly. This is a weird book. (laughs) Let's put it that way. In in many ways. I mean, so he was he was he was asked to write it by Augustus, the first emperor of Rome as a sort of consolidation of power, as having some sort of state propaganda, I guess, right? But th- but why? Why does it look like this? What is, what's going on? Well, it's, it's a book that's doing a lot of different things. It's functioning on one level as imperial propaganda, and there's a ton to say about that. But it's also kind of inserting itself into a much, much bigger history, a history that's in some ways about Greece and Rome, but is also about the history of literature. And that's the way that Virgil's responding to Homer, and in particular the Iliad, but also the Odyssey. So it's, it's a book that's doing an awful lot of different things. And in that sense, it's, it's really sophisticated and polished and remarkable. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's wearing its influence from the Iliad and from the Odyssey on its sleeve, right? I mean, you've got the characters that are right out of the Iliad. You've got a rewriting of many scenes of the Odyssey as he's wandering around. Yeah, I mean, it's weird. Like, it's, I, I don't know whether to call it influence or something else. Because, so one of the things that's happening is it's a source 
for Virgil, right? So the character of Aeneas is already there in the Iliad, but he's a super minor character. But the way he shows up is as having a very specific kind of role. Aeneas gets mentioned in the Iliad as being a survivor. So we know he's someone who's going to come out on the other end of the Trojan War. He's going to be one of the remnant. And we also see him fighting at one point with Achilles. And that tells us something important about him. Achilles is this incredible monumental ferocious figure of a warrior. And so if Aeneas can fight against him, that tells us something about him. He's worthy, right? He's got a a certain kind of quality about him. And then at a particular moment, one of the gods, Poseidon, refers to Aeneas as the destined seed. So he's a survivor, but he's also someone who's going to give rise to something else. Anyway, so, so that's one of the things that Virgil takes out of the Iliad. But he also takes this vision of history out of the Iliad. You were talking about the sort of summary of the plot and the way in which, you know, book one, Aeneas and his men land in Carthage. And then in book four, we hear more about the adventures in Carthage and his relationship with Dido. But books two and three are his story, like Dido has basically said, tell me your story. Like, how'd you get here? What, what's, what, what is your story? And books two and three are your story, but it's also the story of Troy and the story of the Iliad in particular. So there's this weird thing that happens in the Iliad. We know the fall of Troy is coming, but it's beyond the end of the book. And in the Aeneid, we know about the fall of Troy, but it happens before the book starts. So it's almost setting itself up as like a counterpart in a weird kind of, like in other words, it refers to both the Iliad and the Odyssey, but it's setting itself as a the other side of the balance relative to the Iliad. Yeah. I mean, importantly, when it's recounting the Trojan War and the fall of Troy, it starts after the Iliad ends. Exactly. It doesn't tell anything about any of the events that we would have read about in the Iliad. It talks about the Trojan horse. Similarly, the bits that it borrows from the Odyssey, it's coming by after Odysseus has done all these things, and I guess a few years later, and it's revisiting these scenes and finding out other information that allows them to retell the stories to make Odysseus look worse. Mm -hmm. So the Aeneid assumes the existence of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Like, these texts need to be there for you to fully understand what's going on here. It's adding to those stories rather than replacing them in an interesting Mm -hmm. way. Yeah, it's putting itself in conversation with them. And in that sense, you know, when Dante does the same thing to Virgil, it's going to totally make sense because that's the thing that Virgil is doing himself relative to Homer, right? So, like, they're in this conversation, so to speak. So that's why I was, like, stumbling over this idea of influence. Because I don't think it's exactly influence. It's, like, this conversation these books are having with each other with regard to how they embed themselves in the narration of the historical past. Well, I'm still wondering what Augustus was hoping to get out of this and and how this reflects it. I mean, definitely there's a lot of nation building. Definitely there's a lot of big upping the importance of Rome and the Roman state and Rome's future glories. But I wonder if there's something more specific about that. I mean, like the whole bit with Dido is there partially because, okay, Dido is the queen of Carthage and many years later, slash many centuries before this is written, there will be wars with Carthage that will be very important in Rome's history and its conception of itself. Is that why that's there? And if so, like, why is it being described in terms of this love affair? As propaganda, I find it really weird. Well, it's doing a couple of different things. So, I mean, you're definitely getting this pretty heavy-handed Roman propaganda on a number of levels, right? One of the ways you see that manifested is in that sort of relationship with Troy that we're talking about poor Rome is like this fulfillment of Trojan promise, right? But also like in book one, when Venus is upset because of what's been happening to the Trojans and especially her son Aeneas, she goes and complains to Jupiter and Jupiter says, don't worry about it. I made this promise and I'm absolutely going to fulfill it. He promises that they're definitely going to receive what he's promised to them, which is empire without end. So that kind of imperial promise of Rome is something that shows up right in the very beginning of the Aeneid. And then also in book six, when we get down at the underworld, it's going to be a really personal encounter of a lot of ways where Aeneas is going to see his old father and he's going to see Dido, who's going to give him the cold shoulder. But he's also going to see a kind of marching procession of all that lineage and all those rulers all the way down to the time of Augustus Caesar himself, right? So the propaganda element shows up at these two really crucial points, the opening book and then book six when we're in the underworld. But it also shows up, as you were saying, in a weird kind of way in the romance with Dido. His conquest of Dido, which is on the one hand a romantic conquest, is also setting the stage for the Punic Wars, which are in the future in terms of the narration of the Aeneid, but in the past for Virgil. 
So the Punic Wars is the series of wars between Rome and Carthage. They sort of go back and forth. It ends finally with Rome decisively defeating Carthage and famously sowing the city with salt and knocking it down so that no one stone stood upon another. But the reason for the Punic War is sort of embedded in Book Four's account of the break between Dido and Aeneas. It's weird that it's romantic, though, but you could argue that it's saying something about the Carthaginians. I mean, that there's something weird and askew about them, which is precisely that a woman is their leader. This is something that Virgil kind of makes a point to emphasize when we first hear about Dido. No, that's true. I mean, it's also saying something about the Romans, (laughs) Mm. because Aeneas doesn't choose to have sex in a cave with Dido. The gods sort of make this happen for reasons of their own yeah. internal squabbles. There, there's no, I mean, Aeneas gets very little agency in a lot of this. The gods are always pushing him to the next goal. Yeah, yeah. Like, and he didn't really want to leave. He just had to. You know, exactly. it's his destiny. I, that is the eternal debate, right? You see, like, I don't know, even in, like, Augustine's Confessions, he's like, I felt really bad for Dido. <laughs> it's like, you know. Yeah. Whether you think Aeneas is the asshole here or not is the litmus test of this book, if you ask me. Yeah, but I guess I, I'm thinking still about Aeneas as kind of the instantiation of Rome, like yeah, the personification no. of Rome. And, like, Rome has to exist, sure. Rome is decided upon by the gods. But Rome has no choice in its actions, is what we're being told? I mean, I guess, but it seems weird to... to, Maybe it's just my own modern prejudices in terms of what I expect of this, but it it makes Rome sound feeble. Well, it's about destiny, right? Like, what you're obliged to do, what you're expected to do, what is inevitable. And if Roman triumph is inevitable, you, you know, you human being, right, are kind of a step on that path or a cog in the machine. Like you have agency to some extent, but you are also driven on, on that same sort of teleological course, right? You know, the opening lines of the poem, looking at the first 50 lines or so, um, which famously begin, I sing of arms and of a man, right? So it's about warfare and about a man, namely Aeneas, right? And the narration is introduced in terms of like, you know, there's the city Carthage and, you know, what would happen to it, how the Trojans were wandering. For long years, they were cast across all waters, fate driven, wandering from sea to sea. It was so hard to found the race of Rome. And that line is such a strange one, right? Because it seems to be saying to us, you know, these Trojan people are setting out to found the race of Rome, right? To be the seeds that will give rise to the Roman Empire. But to what extent are they doing it? And to what extent are they kind of, I don't want to say pawns, but like mediators or in between parts in an effort that's coming from somewhere completely different? And that, so that question of agency is a really interesting one. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I, I, I probably won't be satisfied <laughs> with it. I think it's just completely foreign. But yeah, it, it's like you said, like if, if, if this is all mandated, like yes, they had to go through difficult experiences. But mm-hmm. how much credit does Rome get to take if this is all stuff that was preordained? Where is where is the glory for them in it? Yeah. And you could see that kind of, I don't want to say anxiety, but like these different ways of responding to how agency is being depicted in the Aeneid in readers' responses, right? I'm thinking of Dante, for example, and others, where they're really struggling with this question of how much control do you as a human being and how much responsibility do you have for your actions? Right? Mm-hmm. So these responses to the Aeneid over time often are preoccupied with this question. That's a weird little poem. Well, let's dive into a specific bit of really interesting nation building and poetry, which is to say the bit about sports, the reason why we're here, the reason why we chose to do this in this cluster. Book five. Which is super weird. It is super weird. It's great in some ways in that it just stops and has some sporting events, seemingly in the middle of, you know, intending to do other things. It's like, no, we're going to just stop and, and hang out at the beach for a while and do some sports. Well, it's super weird. It's super weird. If you think about the structure of the work as a whole, right, you know, it's 12 books long. The, the whole back half, books 7 through 12, it's just sort of, you know, the colonial project, you know, trying to consolidate things and, and, and get down to the business of founding the race of Rome, right? So that's all happening in Italy, right? So that's all one thing. But books 1 through 6, you really have a real sense of, like, structure and shape to the narrative. You know, book 1, they land in North Africa, you know, in Carthage. 2 and 3, it's the backstory, the backstory in Troy in book two, and the backstory wandering around the Mediterranean in book three. Book four, we're back in the here and now, and Dido and Aeneas get together and then break up, right? Aeneas leaves. 
I'm going to skip five. And then book six, we have the journey into the underworld. Like each book is doing what it's obliged to do. It's like got a mission. It's doing it. And so remember the first time I was teaching this, I was reading it and I read book five and I'm like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> like, w- why? <laughs> yeah, why? But it's so cool. But then when I actually went and taught it, I was like, wow, this is the best thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> because it's not warfare, but kind of, sort of, almost. Well, it becomes a precursor to warfare, as a lot of things in the first half of the book seem to be, right? Like mm. Dido and Aeneas, their their love affair and the difficulties of breaking it up become this precursor to the Punic Wars. Mm-hmm, 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 and in a mm-hmm. somewhat similar way, not terribly similar, I guess, but in a somewhat similar way, these sporting events show the young men of future Rome, the young, these young Trojan men, battling with each other in ways that are meant to not have fatal consequences, are meant to show how good they are at physical athleticism in a, in a relatively consequence-free way, in a way that's going to show you what they're going to be like hmm. in the future. Because you can't talk about how they behaved during the Siege of Troy, during the Trojan War, because they lost that, for one thing, and so that's not going to look very good. And also, it's a while ago now, right? Time has passed. And time has passed, and it's six or seven years ago. So you now have this opportunity to show how manly manly, how, how warrior-like they are, in this interesting way that is an echo, that is just a sort of shadow of it, but one that has the strong potential of actually becoming fatal. Well, it does all kinds of weird work, right? You are saying young men, and that's true, except that we also get our attention drawn to the fact that there are age differences. Like in the third of the games, which is boxing, we have an older champion who's kind of on the verge of retirement and a younger fighter. And how that age difference plays out is a big point of emphasis. And then we see warriors that have relationships with one another, and that inflects the way in which the battle turns, the battle, the the sports battle turns out. And then we see boys, like young boys, right at the end of the games. So the generational aspects of this, I think, are super important. Yeah, I think that boxing one might be a particularly interesting way to start, because you have this one guy, this one boxer who's young and who knows he's very good at this, and who's just a jerk about it. <laughs> and nobody wants to fight him because they know, you know, he's he's good. But like they also get the sense that like he's too much of a jerk to want to fight. Darius is just absolutely cocky. He's just he's just saying, come on, bring it on. He says, Oh come on, fight. <laughs> and it tells us like I'm old. Finally he does get pushed into it. And he's losing at first, right? Darius is young and agile and is able to knock him down a bit. But then suddenly, like it's just it just snaps. And perhaps there's a divine intervention or something, but until suddenly he's like full of ability and power and starts wailing on Daris and nearly kills him and has to be pulled off by Aeneas. It's such a great passage. I had to read a few lines of it because it's so great. Entellus spent his strength upon the wind. His own weight, his own force had carried him heavily and heavily with his huge hulk down to the ground, just as at times a hollow pine torn up from its roots falls. Right? Um, but then his anger spurs his force. His shame, his knowledge of his worth excite his power. Furiously, he drives Darius headlong all over the field. And now his right hand doubles blows, and now his left. He knows no stay or rest. So he pummels Darius. And then Aeneas is like, you know... <laughs> <laughs> you know, let him go, let him go. And so finally, Aeneas's orders ended the bout. But Derry's faithful comrades now lead him to the ships. He drags along his weak knees, and his head sways back and forth. He spits thick gore out of his mouth and teeth that mingle with his blood. Ew. Yeah. But it's like, it's, I mean, how, I mean, it, I don't know if you're a watch boxing. I used to watch boxing with my dad growing up. He loved boxing, and his father loved it before him, right? And like, that's pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much what that looks like. And this whole question of what's going on socially. Exactly. And then what happens next, of course, is that, so, you know, Antelus is won, and he wins the prize, which is a bull. You know, content warning, skip ahead 30 seconds, because animal cruelty. And he just walks up to the bull, punches it straight in the brains, and kills it outright, to, as if to show, this is what I could have done. Mm-hmm. This is what I could have done to you. Yeah, and it's like this sacrificial moment, right? Yeah, but it's also this other interesting substitution, right? Like, mm-hmm. it, while we're having the substitution for a battle, for the future battles, we've got a substitution for the death of Daris. We've mm-hmm. got this bull that's taking his place. To say, I could kill him. Exactly. And now this, this beast is going to die. So there's all this sort of interesting deferral happening here. And that's when he throws down his gloves. Like, he gives up his gloves. I lay down my oh, gloves, yeah. my arms. He, he's never going to fight again. Yeah. He's done. 
And fair enough. Yeah. He didn't really need to fight that time, did he? But it really exposes in this really bald way that this is a substitute for battle, like standing in the place of battle. So in a way, it's practice. In a way, it's almost educational. Like, it's important that there are spectators, right? They're learning something from this, I think. Each one of these uh, series of four games, everybody is learning something from it. It's also important for them to learn not to be cocky in that sense, right? Like, you can be proud of your abilities, but you can't be proud to the point of alienating your fellow man, so to speak. These are people you need to be going into battle with eventually and need to be defending. And while you can be proud of who you are and know your place, you can't be cocky about it. You can't be a, you can't be an asshole about it. That's going to destroy the unity of the troops. And other things too, right? You want to know when to quit, right? And tell us is going to give up his gloves to lay them down, right? So having a sense of I don't know, the life cycle of the warrior in a sense, like what benefits youth gives you, what benefits experience gives you. There's an awful lot going there. And like that's what the boxing match does specifically. But the games have this really interesting effect on the men, right? Because it shows, like we were applying this before, by showing different levels of physical ability and cleverness in the sport, it sort of stratifies the men, right? It shows who's stronger and who's weaker, who's more accomplished, less accomplished, who's more intelligent on the field and who's less intelligent, and also who's a leader and what leadership might look like. We get a really strong sense of a sequence in these four games. First, there's a rowing competition, which has a whole bunch of boats. So there's like teams, so to speak, of men in each of these boats, and each boat has a name. Then there's going to be a foot race. Then there's the boxing that we just talked about. And then finally, there'll be archery. But before we get the series of four games with this really interesting kind of ritual activity, you said earlier already that the reason for the games is because Aeneas wants to commemorate the death of his father, Anchises, to have sort of a, a ritual that's going to mark his death and honor it. Right. And this is, again, a shout out back to the Iliad, because in the Iliad, we see Achilles put on funeral games in memory of Patroclus, his beloved, his beloved, right, his lover. Um, So here it's a paternal love. There it was a different kind of love. Right. So there's a there's a lot to say about that. But therefore, unsurprisingly, we start with a ritual. Aeneas says that he wants to make sacrifices to honor his father. May he grant that when I build a city, I may observe these rites year after year in temples dedicated to him. So, and then we're going to have these games, he says. So he does this ritual of pouring out bowls, two bowls of pure wine and two bowls of new milk, two of victim's blood, that is animals that have been sacrificed. And then he, you know, praises his father. And then an omen happens. A serpent comes and tastes the bowls. And then there's a series of sacrifices. Again, pairs, a pair of sheep, two swine, two steers. Right? So this is, I don't know how to say, this ritual stuff at the beginning is so fascinating, I think, because it's appropriate, right? It's a funeral commemoration, but it's also setting the stage for the competitions. And I can't help thinking about contemporary sports competition, all the ritual that goes into it, especially championships and things like that. The games are part of something much bigger and something collective that is still individual. Like we have outstanding sports figures. We have like rivalries. Like if you follow soccer, you have like Messi and Ronaldo or something. You know, you have these rivalries these one-on-one rivalries, but you also have these teams. And there's a lot of ritual that goes around the whole sports event. And and that, it's, it's so resonant and weird reading book five of the Aeneid here and seeing those games before you, or not seeing it in this case, because we don't have a lot of organized sport going on this summer, right? Hmm, that's true. But like, so these games are rituals too, right? Yeah. And of course, a lot of the modern sporting events were created by people who were growing up reading, you know, getting a classical education and therefore being inspired by stories of the Olympics and reading the Aeneid and things like this. So this idea that ritual is a good civilized part of sports, I don't know whether it reemerged in that way or whether it's a through line. I, yeah, I don't know. There's got to be a lot to say about that. You know, when we were talking about C.L.R. James's Beyond a Boundary, right, this is one of the things we were talking about, the extent to which the idea of things being cricket, like certain codes of behavior and norms of behavior were bound up with public school education, by which I mean, you know, British public school education, like private elite education, and a certain kind of curriculum. Um, it's incredibly interesting to think about how these two reinforce one another. And I found myself wondering how trans translation practices and reception of book five, like to some extent, Virgil shapes those public school and public school sport practices. But to some extent, presumably, those sport practices in the public school setting also shape the ways in which people think about book five of the Aeneid, right? Both Mm. of those things have to be true. 
which I think is super interesting. But yeah, so we get this series of games and the rowing is the one that I mentioned already is kind of collective, right? And each boat has a name. One of them is called Shark. One of them is called Chimera. One is called Centaur and one is called Scylla, right? So oh, you'll, you'll be intrigued to know that in the translation that I read. The, the, so yeah, I, we never actually mentioned that, but I was reading the Sarah Rudin and you were reading the Alan Mandelbaum translation. But in my translation, uh, it's the whale, ah, not the shark. Oh, really? Yeah. That's so cool. So the four boats are kind of competing against one another, each team, so to speak, or each crew, right, battling against one another. And one of the most striking things about this competition, I think, is not the midst of the competition, like the way it was in the boxing match that we were talking about a little bit earlier, but rather how they're getting ready at the starting line, right? So um, this is a little description here. They choose places by lot. Above the sterns, far off, the captains gleam in purple, gold. The oarsmen are crowned with poplar leaves. Their naked shoulders are glistening, wet with oil. They man the benches. Their arms are tense upon the oars. They wait, expectant for the start, as throbbing fear and eager love of praise drain their high hearts. And then at last the competition begins. So this idea of them being almost like, it's like so erotic, A. Eh? But B, it's also like the sense of them being kind of coiled up, right? That there's all this potentiality in them right? In these bodies. I find that so interesting, right? And it really cuts to the heart of what this sport is about. It's about identifying the potentiality, like the, the potentiality for warfare in these bodies, right? They're, they're being gotten ready. If we think about it in terms of the overall structure of these books, right? We were talking about this before, how the books all clearly have a function. And when you first read book five, you're like, sports, really? Like, what is this for? But it's about getting the people ready, figuring out who's outstanding as a leader or as a warrior, and it also establishes Aeneas' capacity to lead the men, right? It lets him display his leadership, not just in telling people what to do and like persuading, you know, the older boxer to come out and actually engage, but also to sort out conflicts, to resolve potential disharmony, dissatisfaction between the group. He keeps giving out gifts. And this is a really important part of what's happening here. Yes, although where does he get all these gifts? That is a set of ships laden. With gifts. Yeah, well, he's got lots of goodies in that ship. So many goodies. But anyway, yes, he does. And also importantly, one of the ships hits some rocks along the way and comes in very, very much in last place and everybody's laughing. Mm -hmm. So he gives out first prize and he gives out second prize and he gives out third prize and they're all very nice. Now, while the victors swaggered in the thrill of rich rewards, red ribbons on their heads, Sir Gestus reached the shore. He'd worked his hole free of the cruel rock, lost his oars, and bashed a row of oar locks useless. He won only laughter. And so they talk about how, okay, the ship had gotten stuck, etc., etc., etc. Aeneas, though, happy that the ship and crew were safe, still gave Sir Gestus what he'd promised, a Cretan slave girl, Foloi, quite skilled at Minerva's work and mother of twin babies. So you get the sense of like, okay, everybody's laughing at this person who came in last, but Aeneas, perhaps more than anyone, although maybe not at the same time, understands that like stuff happens. You're not always to blame for your failures. Sometimes the gods are just against you and you still deserve to be welcomed home. Like getting stuck on the rocks is not the same thing as being a jerk in the boxing ring. But also like, wow, what a prize. You get a slave girl who's skilled at Minerva's work. So she's a good weaver. And you get twins in the bargain. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't feel comfortable with that gift at all. But it is also an interesting prelude to future spoils of war when, when they're going to be fighting in Italy. And part of the plunder is going to be the, the women that they're going to bring into their society, whether they like it or not. Well, this is how, you know, this is how Aeneas succeeds along with his men in being, what is it that Poseidon calls him? The destined seed, right? Ugh, ugh. I mean, I'm telling you, that's the metaphor here, right? That's what's going oh, on. Oh, I know. These, this, women, this, these women are the ground on which their seed will grow, right? That's what this, this is about. Is to this, is a, this is a poem that is totally okay with this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In case you to make this clear, this is an extremely patriarchal environment here. <laughs> yes. It's very imperial, very patriarchal, very... Oh, very everything. And 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 actually here in book five, I mean, this is one of the places where that patriarchal quality gets made super, super clear because Aeneas is commemorating his own father, Anchises, and he's going to be constantly called, and increasingly after book five, Father Aeneas, right? This, so this role of him as a, the father of his people, this is where this gets grounded. So that's super important, I think. 
There is also something else interesting on that note, but I think we should probably get back to the sports and then let's remember to talk about the patriarchy again at the end. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm always happy to talk about the patriarchy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, so the second, so we saw rowing and between the rowing and the boxing is the second competition, the foot race. And that's the one that we featured in the cold open because that is a super interesting passage where things apparently all go wrong where we've got this competition going, you know, different guys are running and one of them slips in the mud, which has gotten, you know, sort of filthy from the blood of the sacrifices that were made a little bit earlier as part of the opening ritual of the games. And he falls, but when he falls, he drags down one of the other competitors. And he does this not just out of sour grapes or to be unpleasant, but because he wants to make sure his friend who's also running in this competition is going to come in first. And like, this is a real shitstorm. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, because, because yeah, they've also fallen into the dung from those animals. <laughs> exactly. So Aeneas needs to sort this out. Now, he's already promised before the running competition started that there was going to be some kind of attention to equity. He said to all of the competitors, let your hearts hear this, pay attention, not one of you shall leave without a gift, right? So everybody's going to get goodies. Right. And I've got all these prizes here. I've got this horse for first prize. Second prize will be a quiver full of Thracian arrows and a gold belt. And the third will get this Greek helmet. So great prizes, right? And now he's got to resolve all this at the end. So when this race takes place and this is all kind of messed up, there's a lot of complaint, right, about how this is going to be sorted out. Is he going to do a sort of review of play and put everybody back in the proper order, right? Like, what is going to happen? And so what happens is this. Your rewards will not be touched, said Father Aeneas. Men, no one will change the order of prizes. Let it be for me to pity the way things turned out against my blameless friend. So he gives as gift to Salius, who would have come in first otherwise, but was dragged down, the giant hide of a Getulian lion, heavy with shaggy hair and gilded claws. But Nisus is upset because the first, second, and third prizes have gone out, but he's been dragged to the ground. He's really upset. He says, what worthy gift can now be given Nisus, who would have won the first prize by his merit, had not malicious fortune hampered me? And, you know, first of all, speaking of himself in the third person, that shouldn't disqualify him alone but um but and he's like he's all filthy right but the best of fathers smiled on him and he is and ordered a shield brought from the ships and so he gives that to this prize to him so he's given out the prizes that he said he would give out but he's also gone and gotten an extra prize from the ships in order to make sure everybody's okay and this is so interesting right when you think about what is it showing us about aeneas Right. First of all, he's got a lot of gifts, but also like he's managing these guys in a really, really skillful kind of way and making them indebted to him. Right. He says, we're not going to shift the order. Your rewards won't be touched. No one will change the order of prizes. Let me straighten it out. And implicitly, that's putting him in this position of tremendous authority. Right. It's for him to give gifts. Right. His father and he is. But at the same time, it's also doing this other thing. Right. Where, again, fate has to be respected. Right. The order that you all came in is the order, and nothing will change that. And you're going to get gifts based on that order and nothing else. Mm -hmm. But I'm in a position in this sort of godlike, I get to make all the decisions here position of being able to say, I accept that what happened to you happened to you because of cruel fate intervening. And I can ameliorate that. That's something which I, in my position of leadership, will choose to do, which is not something that the gods actually do no. very often. Mm -hmm. And again, Aeneas is somebody who has been treated badly, perhaps by fate, by, by his destiny, has had all sorts of terrible things happen to him, and no one has intervened, generally speaking, and made it better for him. Except his mom. I mean, there's his mom. <laughs> well, his mom does a few times, but not not necessarily in the ways he wants. Although, no, that's true. But he is going to try above and beyond to make sure that that's something that he can do for people. It's not just making it better, though. I mean, I really think it's a it's deeply vested in Aeneas' own authority. Like, this is about making his authority. I don't I want to say patriarchal, but you know what I mean. It's oh, making yeah, yeah, him yeah. into making him into Father Aeneas, not just the leader of the Trojan refugees, right? But someone that stands in a certain kind of, not godlike position, but a higher position. You know, he has the capacity to give beyond what other men can give. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's totally true. It's, it's absolutely that kind of positioning himself in terms of power. I'm just interested in comparing Father Aeneas to Father Zeus. Right. Yeah. yeah and they yeah, seem yeah. to be being fathers in very different ways. I think that's definitely true. So after the racing comes the boxing, which we've already talked about, and then archery, which 
I don't know if we have enough time to go into it in much detail, but rather remarkable things happen in the archery. <laughs> They get an omen, and one that Aeneas is so pleased by and so enchanted by that he gives the person who shot that arrow a very special gift. I don't know if you noticed it. It's a bowl engraved with figures, but it belonged to Anchises himself, that is Aeneas' father. So it's a bowl whose value lies in more than its material worth. Right. It's, it's a very intimate connection to Aeneas. And then they do the weirdest thing ever. <laughs> yes. Which is to bring out the little boys. What do you make of that? Well, I don't know how little they are. I feel like this is part of a rite of manhood or something. Like, this is the thing that you do immediately before you get to be a man. Yeah, they're not quite old enough to be in the sports competitions. Exactly. But they're also organized as if they were in squads with captains. And it's like, you ever watch soccer championship matches? When they bring out the kids at the beginning, the kids come out hand in hand with the players. It's not their kids. It's just random kids. No, it's it's kids who also are playing in soccer leagues. It's like kids who get chosen for this because they're outstanding in their soccer leagues. Is it, in fact, because they're particularly good? Well, I don't know if they individually are the most outstanding players, but, like, these are kids who are in competitive soccer leagues. That's what makes them eligible, so to speak, to participate in this way. It's and so I know weird. it's not the same thing, but I'm like, when I read this, I was like, okay, this is that, sort of. Yeah, it's. I think it is very similar to that. It's a sense of, like, this is, this is your participation in some small way in this adult male culture that you're going to be part of soon. But it's about time, right? It's about, this is their future, right? They're children, but they're looking forward to this kind of warrior-like future on the field, right? And it's also our collective future as spectators, right? Because this is what the future of the quasi battle right on the sports field is going to look like so so you know we're talking earlier about history and the ways in which the aeneid situates itself relative to the iliad and more broadly rome situates itself relative to troy and we're talking about like big historical change like in a way sport is always also about that too right it's always also about time and history and where the collective whether it's the nation or the team or whatever right clr james was also super interested in this where it sees itself in history where it sees itself in time. So weird. So getting back now to the patriarchy again. (laughs) You can't escape. So after we have all this sporting (laughs) activity, we end with a very different scene with women on the beach. Stupid women. What are they doing? (laughs) Well, they're getting really tired of all this nonsense. Not necessarily the sports nonsense, but it's been seven years since they left Troy. (laughs) They may also be bored with the sports nonsense at this point. It may be totally fair that they're like, "Mm, this isn't for me. But yeah, they have nothing to do with this. They're not part of this nation-building exercise, right? That's right. So they're exhausted. They want to settle down already. They're hanging out down by the boats. And they're hanging out down by the boats. And they are incited by a god, by Iris on behalf of Juno. They're incited to set fire to the fleet in order to force the men to just stay here. We can found a city here. This is good enough. Can we just get out of the car? This will do. It is so let's get out of the car moment. This is exactly what's going on. And uh uh-oh, all of our ships are on fire. So Aeneas prays to Jupiter, causes a storm, the fleet is salvaged. It's all fine. But like they've realized that they've hit a crisis point. This level of violence (laughs) against your own stuff doesn't happen unless people are in a bad place, right? (laughs) So uh, Aeneas has to figure out how to solve this one. And he decides to let some of the women and basically anybody who wants to, the old, the frail, the people who are just tired of all this. The people who are superfluous. Is the way this translation puts it, which I think is really great. Oh, my, my translation doesn't use the word superfluous, it looks like. Um, it says, Leave him the lost ships, orphans, and the travelers defeated by the hardships of your great tasks. Spare the old men and the ocean-weary mothers, and anybody weak or shy of danger, and let them rest and have their city here, named for Acestes, if he will allow it. So that's perfectly nice. It's a perfectly, you know, I, that seems like a reasonably good solution to this situation. Yes, let's let some people stay. Yeah, no, but it's super neat, right? Because you can see it as a really good example of Father Aeneas at his best in two ways. One, a kind of warm, you know, these are the people who are tired, they're old, the women, you know, they've had enough. Let's make like a little Troy here. And they do. They establish it. They name the different parts of the city they're going to found after Troy. Right? And so that's really kind and thoughtful, those people. The colder way of understanding it is that he's getting rid of all the dead wood. Yep. He's only going to take the people who are hungry for empire, those who are strong and really want to be revved up and ready to go. 
So on the one hand, it's kind of generous and benign. On the other hand, it's like real cold-blooded, I think. Well, we've talked about book five more than anyone has ever talked about it. No, that's not true, but we've talked about it for quite a bit. <laughs> it's so good. It's totally interesting, and I and I hope that we touched on other parts of at least the first half of the book. Is there anything about the second half that you want to bring up before we wrap things up? The second half is incredibly boring. Okay. And you know, in the Middle Ages, when they used to write commentaries on the Aeneid, they used to almost always stop after book six, and I'm like, right you are. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. This is It is very much the undiscovered country for me. I just... I mean, I read the rest of it, and it was like... Fine. Book 12 has some good parts. I've, I've read book 12 a few times because people keep telling me it's good. And the ending is pretty haunting in interesting ways, but... Hmm. The rest of it's excruciating. I don't know. No. But I suppose we should talk a bit more about what happened to this book afterwards. Like, why did it become the most important book ever in European history? Yeah, just about. Maybe second to the Bible. Maybe. Well, I mean, I guess one of the things has to do with its Latinity, right? Like, it functioned as a school text, right? And so... It's like almost like vocabulary, right? Like it's it's something that a lot of people, or at least a lot of people who were educated in a particular way, knew. So it was a point of reference or like a crossroads or something. So that's got to be one thing that's going on. And then also this whole question of epic, right? Like it's a book that's really self-consciously setting itself up as, you know, following in the footsteps of Homer, right? And so you can imagine these other writers who come afterward, you know, Dante, Milton, right? They want to do that too, right? So Virgil becomes to them what Homer was to Virgil, right? It's part of this kind of, not to get all patriarchy again, but you know, it's part of that patriarchal lineage of the author, right? So that's a kind of a thing that's happening too. And then also then there's epic, right? And if you want to think about what epic is for, it's about nation building. It's about imagining a community and bringing it into being. And in some ways functioning as a kind of propaganda for that nation or that empire, right? So that's super powerful, right? That's an intoxicating drug right there. I also like that in its medieval history, in its medieval reception, it was used as a kind of a magic text as well. There was a kind of game. The Sortes Virgiliana, isn't that exactly. it? Exactly. A, a game where you would sort of open up your copy of the Aeneid and pop your finger down and read the line that you had landed upon, and it would tell you some wisdom about your situation or quandary. Yeah. Like in Augustine's Confessions, he talks about doing that. I think he, he talks about doing it with scripture, right? But it's the same idea. And actually, there's similar practice in other parts of the world, too. I've heard of people, Persian people, doing that with Hafez's poetry. Supposedly, you could like open the book anywhere and it will give you, in an oracular kind of way, the answer to what you're looking for. It's a phenomenal idea. Have you ever tried it? No. <laughs> Not that. But I will now. It sounds like a great idea. I think I did try it once when we were when we were taking Latin class, and I don't remember it having particularly interesting results, but did it, it didn't work. But there you go. Mm. The magic is is has thinned out from the world. Yeah. And yeah, Virgil also got associated with magic because of the prophetic the supposedly prophetic quality of some of the other works he had written, in particular his fourth eclogue, which was read as a kind of a prophecy of the birth of Jesus by some people. Right. So there's like there's a whole mystique that got associated with his work, not just the Aeneid, but his other writings as well. And we've just talked about the sort of the the big boy response to Virgil. So like Augustine, Dante, Milton. But there's also been efforts and you can line this up with other kinds of efforts to sort of write back to these very patriarchal texts. I haven't read it, but there's an adaptation or a response to the Aeneid by Ursula Le Guin called Lavinia. And I mean, she's such a good writer. I'd be curious to know how well that experiment worked. Yeah, I'd be super curious about that. Also, because it's being told from Lavinia, the, the woman being vied for in the second half of the book between you know, Aeneas and Turnus and so forth. Like, that's interesting. It's about the second half of the Aeneid. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> so yeah, no, she's she's generally interesting, and I would be super curious about this. I didn't know about that book until a day or two ago, so I haven't had a chance to check it out, but I am curious. When you read the Aeneid, do you recognize Dante's Virgil in it? Hmm. That's interesting. Only in book six. I mean, it's impossible not to think about Dante when you read Virgil's book six, because it's also the underworld, and it was one of the most important models for Dante's vision of the afterlife, though there are others as well. What's so striking to me always is that book six of the Aeneid feels very horizontal, where Dante's Inferno feels very vertical, right? <laughs> so for Dante, it's like this concentric circles, and there's this idea of descent into the underworld, and it's like deeper and deeper and deeper, and you know, there's a there's a real hierarchy, so to speak, in the underworld. Whereas for Virgil, it's like there's neighborhoods. <laughs> You know, like it's this, and I just find that fascinating that in some ways it's like, oh, this is the same world we saw in Dante, but it's 
on a different plane. Like it's, it's just spatially very different. And as I'm always struck by that, one of the things I was struck by actually reading the Aeneid for today was noticing, you know, like we were saying before, you notice things you've never noticed before. I was reading this one little passage in book one and I was like, oh, that's like this passage in like Chaucer's Clerk's Tale. And it's just, it's, it's a trivial thing. It's not important, but like, there's always something where you go, oh, that's that. That's that. That's that. Right, you know? right, right, right. And, and it's so cool because it's like you're recognizing these moments. It's like recognition. You're like, oh, that's what this person was thinking about or that's what this person was thinking about. It's not like a simple case of like source and influence, but rather intertextual relationships. And it's so neat to recognize those when they come up. It's like, I don't know, puzzles or something like that. Well, and that gets back to the whole notion that this is a very interesting text, whether you like it or not, as a, as a poem or as a thing to read, it's interesting and it's important. And so it weaves through so much that it's worth reading for that alone. It, it, even, if it's a, even if it's a bit of a, a bitter pill to swallow at times, and even if you skip the second half. Yeah, and parts of it are great. I mean, I oh, do yeah, think yeah, parts yeah. of it are incredibly interesting and exciting. Like one of my very favorite parts is this moment when he's encountered the Sybil and he's going to say, oh, by the way, can I go visit my dad down here in the underworld? But the Sybil shows up in this really staggering kind of way. So they get to this place where it's a cave uh, with a hundred gates and there's voices rushing from the gates. Just as the Trojans reached the threshold, the virgin cried, Now call upon the fates for oracles. The god is here, the god. As she says this before the doors, her face and color alter suddenly. Her hair is disarrayed, her breast heaves, and her wild heart swells with frenzy. She is taller now, her voice is more than human, for the power of God is closing in. He breathes upon her. And are you slow to offer vows and prayers, Trojan Aeneas? Are you slow, she shouts? The terrifying house will never open its giant jaws before your vows are spoken. The Sybil spoke and then was still. And the Trojans were like, whoa! <laughs> it's so great. Like, stuff like that, I think, is awesome. It has its moments, for sure. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, I'm afraid that's about all the time we have for talking about the Aeneid for right now. And we really only looked at book five. But <laughs> it's okay. It was sporty. You can certainly find people talking about books four and six in particular anywhere else hmm. if you look up discussions about it. So I feel I feel happy that we focused on book five and still managed to talk about many of the same things that you would have talked about looking at those other more famous books. Next time, we're going to be looking at a very different book, uh, Georges Perec's W, or The Memory of Childhood, an interesting combination of memoir of, of his time during World War II and retelling of a story that he invented as a child about a sports-obsessed mythical island nation. It's a book that I really love, haven't read for a while, but I'm super excited to turn back to and, and reread. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it too. I haven't read it yet, but you've recommended it, so I can't wait. Ooh, I hope it's good. I hope I, I hope I don't regret it. In the meantime, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at spouter at megaphonic.fm, or we're on Twitter at The Spouter. We'd love to hear from you. Show notes with links for anything we've mentioned in this episode are at megaphonic.fm slash spouter slash 32. And the Spouter Inn is one of the fancy little podcasts over at Megaphonic FM. So until next time. Until next time, see you again at the Spouter Inn.